Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Neighbors from MIT and talk about the geometry of Vichy curvature. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for starters, thank you very much for bringing me out here. Um, I'd also like to preface this by saying this is my first computer talk. I'm morally opposed to them in general. I'm doing this me because too. it's a of Thank you. Um, <laughs> that being said, you know, a little forgiveness for whatever involving that. <clears throat> so, um, what's that? Never mind. <laughs> because I, I'm going to say a lot of non-technical stuff, and it's just easier than writing it all. Okay. I mean, get more in, but maybe that's not a good thing. Yeah, that's a problem with these computers. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Okay, so basically I'm going to do some background, and then we're going to cover various topics, and I may actually skip some of these, depending on how time is. Um, uh, we'll talk about some new results involving lower Amici curvature, what's been happening in the last few years, same deal with bounded Amici curvature if there's some time. We'll talk in the opposite direction about not just uh, how nice things might look, but how bad things might not look. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to mention a little bit about the fact that I mean, some of the ideas that are going to pop up here actually apply to a lot of areas. They're actually very general, even though they sound like they're applying to Einstein manifolds. They really aren't. <clears throat> Background. Okay. We're talking about a manifold. Okay, so this is just MGP. G is a Riemannian metric. P is a point in there throughout this whole talk. N is the dimension of the thing. Always. I'm always fixing a dimension. Unless I say otherwise. Rn is supposed to be the full curvature tensor. Like roughly speaking, if you don't know what this is, what this means is that uh, if you're on Euclidean space, if you look at second derivatives, say of vector fields if you want, but it doesn't really matter, then they commute. You can take one derivative then another, or you can switch the direction, it doesn't matter. But on a manifold, this is false. Curvature measures how much is false, right? So it somehow measures geometry. It turns out to be in a really good sense. And the Ricci curvature is the trace of this, okay? So it measures on average how much uh, the cur uh, how much you can't really commute second derivatives. Um, Ricci curvature pops up in lots of situations, so we actually care about this quantity, although it looks a little funny. And finally, if you pick a point in your manifold in some radius, B sub R of X is just the ball of radius R around that point. Fairly intuitive, right? And the volume is just volume uh, of the thing. Okay. So. <clears throat> The first thing I'm going to say is that it's oftentimes convenient. I mean, if you, you pick a manifold, you have some sort of geometric structure. I don't care what that is. And if you want to study what that structure says about the space, it turns out to be more useful often to study the limits of these things, so sequences of such things. Because the sequence of such things can look much worse, in a sense. So instead of picking one guy with this geometric logic, you pick an infinite sequence, and you ask it to limit to something. And usually this limiting, I mean, strictly speaking, I always talk about volume of Hausdorff limits, but if you don't know what this is, that doesn't matter. It's just some way of taking a sequence of metric spaces and getting a new metric space out of it. And then oftentimes you want to study that limit metric space and how bad that can be, because that's just somehow supposed to be the epitome of how bad your structure can look on your original guys. And oftentimes an assumption that will be made, and we'll call the sequence non-collapsed, and this is why we fix these points PI in our convergence, if the volume around that point is bounded strictly from below. Um, for Einstein manifolds or, or lower Ricci bound, you should it's almost view this as an energy. It's like saying the energy is finite. As volume goes to zero, things get bad. So oftentimes we want to stop that from happening. Otherwise, we call the sequence a collapsed sequence if, if the volume is going to zero. So, oh, yeah, let's keep that there for the moment. Chalk. What's that? Were you looking for some chalk? Yes. Well, I'm just checking. There you go. Easy example. Take a cylinder of radius r or something, imagine r going to zero, what's it actually limit to geometrically align? Right? That's collapse. We're starting easy and we'll do up. Okay. Uh, given a limit space, a metric space, well, what's different about a, a limit space than, than, than a smooth manifold that's approximating it? Infinitesimal structure. That's how they differ. Manifolds always look like just flat Euclidean space if you go small enough. That's not true for limit spaces. That's actually very convenient. So what they look like, it may be very different. And this comes in the notion of a tangent cone. So what do you do for a tangent cone? A tangent cone basically means that you, you pick a point in your limit space. Um, you maybe are, here's maybe our, our metric space here. You pick some point. You pick some radius of small r. And what this definition here is saying is that you look at the corresponding space that's supposed to be x sub xr. I don't know why it's over there. So here's x, x sub xr. And it just sort of takes this space here 
and it looks at this ball, and it's like a microscope. It takes the ball of radius log with ball of radius rule. And you, you imagine ours being very, very small. So you're microscoping it up. And a tangent cone is simply something that happens that if you fix a point here and you let r go to zero, and you keep microscoping this thing out, and you let that limit to something else, right? So that, that, that's a tangent cone. Just two examples to keep in the back of your head. If we had picked a smooth manifold, there's always a cone. It just depends on the situation in question. If you have non-collapse and a lower Ricci bound as a limit, then yes, but not always. Otherwise, it's like a snowman. So like here, if you're taking these nice smooth points here, the tangent cone, it's a manifold there, should just be R in. So if I look at x of x, it should be R in. If x is not the cone point, and if x is the cone point, then the tangent cone at this point, um, which I'm just denoting by a sub here, is just the space itself originally, right? Because you dilate, nothing really changes from the space. Right? So th this is the easy example to keep in the back of your head. Oh no, it's doing it to me again. It's supposed to be in bullets. Um, okay. Um, that being said, one more last definition I want to throw at you just to keep in the back of your head is that of stratification. Now we can do this all rigorously, like that's being done here, but let's not worry about this so much. Once you know a tangent cone's infinitesimal behavior, what you usually like to do is split out points uh, of your metric space based on what this infinitesimal behavior looks like. So like if it's a, um, a nice Riemannian orbifold or something like this, or just like a, a point like this, we, we have two things we want to consider. So this point here we call zero conical. What's that mean? That just means it's a cone. So the, 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 the metric space itself, this is like C over some Y. This is how I pictured it, or Y here with this cross section. So it's zero conical, uh, a metric space at a point, if it's just a cone at, at that point. And we say that it's, say, k conical if it looks like rk cross something. So if this is zero conical with respect to this point, we could have crossed this with r like this and made it one conical. Right? So we just like to split up points based on the infinitesimal behavior. So these are all the one conical points. Up here, the tangent cones were all r in, so these are all the n conical points. Right, so our stratum has two components, the, the, the in stratum and the one stratum, the way it's written. So you can be both. What's that? It's not mutually exclusive. Uh, so, I mean, strictly speaking, the reason, the, the, so the definition there is a little bit more complicated. Um, so apparently, I'm sorry, so when my file got transferred over to this computer, it changed stuff on it, so things are not organized very well anymore. Um, so, uh, it's defined in a slightly sort of um, double negative fashion so that that doesn't happen. Um, and also because tangent cones may not be unique. So it's defined in a way where the, actually the k is actually the set of points that no tangent cone splits an rk plus 1 factor. Right? I'm skipping these technical things. But defined like that, they are mutually exclusive. Set otherwise, the set of um, the, the k stratum here should be the points where the infinitesimal if infinitesimal behaviors have k degrees of symmetry, not k plus one degrees of symmetry, but at, mo at most k degrees of symmetry. So what the third line there? What is the statement that goes with that? What's the actual statement? This one? Yeah. Absolutely. So you're you're right. That, that, that was a little sloppy there. If the limit space X comes from a sequence of Riemannian manifolds, um, where the reach curvature is bound from below and the volume is bound from below, so they're not collapsed, then at every point the tangent cone is zero conical. It's an actual cone over something. That, that's the rigorous statement. That'll be made again later. OK. So now that we've sort of thrown some definitions at you and now. There are unique tangent cones and they are zero conical. <coughs> uh, they don't have to be unique, just zero conical. They'll all be cones, but they don't have to be unique. <coughs> OK. So yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, this is kind of small, okay, I think. Oh well. Um, so what I'm going to do now is basically do a, a crash course uh, of sort of getting increasing difficulty. So I want to consider limit spaces. So, so maybe I'll even write some of this now. And I want to ask the following. We're going to assume more and more restrictive conditions on, on what these things satisfy here. And ask what do we know about this? if we know something about these guys here. The very first result in this direction was done probably in the early 70s. This was done by Cheeger. And this is, so from a geometric point of view, you assume as much as humanly possible. That is, you, you assume that the sectional curvatures of these things are all bounded. 
and you assume there's a lower volume bound so it's not collapsed. I mean, to a ge geometer, you can't assume more. And if that happens, this limit is actually a, a Riemannian manifold. So the point is, nothing changes. You, you can't leave the space of Riemannian manifolds in this context. It's, it's a very clean situation. 1965. 1965. Yeah. <laughs> this thesis. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. OK, if you up the situation a little bit, where now you still assume sectional bounds, right? So this is like everything curvature-wise, but you let volume go to zero. Things become harder. This was done by Fukaya. Um, again, I don't know the exact year, but I'd say early 90s, something like that. Um, this required very new ideas, and what he proved there is the following. In this case, so this thing should be like something lower dimensional you're picturing, like this situation here. It may not be a Riemannian manifold, but it's a stratified Riemannian manifold. So basically, I mean, once you split it up based on the stratum we did before, each strata is itself a Riemannian manifold, and they connect together nicely. That, that's essentially the theorem. And the columns move around bundles over these strata. Yeah, if you like. I mean, it's even cleaner than that. I mean, they're, they're actually quotient spaces. There's a smooth Riemannian manifold that's a quotient of. So it's a very clean picture. Uh, and, and you can up this a little bit if you want to study the Riemannian orbit full points. So from a geometric point of view, we like to do this because this is where you can do the most analysis. Curvature doesn't blow up at these points. And you can say that away from uh, a set of dimensions, say n minus 5, that's the dimension of these things, this is always a Riemannian orbit full. In particular, the main reason we're going to use this later on is that if this is a sequence of four manifolds with boundless sectional curvature, this is always a Riemannian orbifold. You can't be worse than orbifold. And then the limits. Um, and, okay, next scenario. Now, we've gone to, we, we've talked about um, non collapsing boundless sectional curvature. That's perfect. What happens if you drop the upper boundless sectional curvature? Lower bounds are best. So, so what if you have a lower boundless sectional curvature here and it's non collapsed? Well, if you have the upper bound, this is a Riemannian manifold, which is a lower bound, you lose this. But it is homeomorphic to a Riemannian manifold. Topologically, it doesn't degenerate too bad. Even in a Lipschitz sense, it doesn't degenerate too bad. But you lose a Riemannian structure. That, that was a, um, <clears throat> a theorem by essentially Grove and P Peterson, but it also follows from work of uh, Perlman, where he proved something much, much more general in this context. But the sharp points are still manifolds. Uh, the curvature is very positive. Yeah, yeah. You get sharp points, but they're that, 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 they're still exactly right. You get something like that. this, but it's still a manifold, right? So this is like a this is still like a, a homeomorphic to a smooth manifold. This picture here, right? But it isn't a Riemannian manifold. That's exactly what happened. And finally, um, where are we reading now? At the very bottom. <laughs> and finally, if you have a, a lower sectional bound and the volume goes to zero. Um, then what Perlman proved is this is very analogous, like with the bound section was that this guy here, it may not be a Riemannian stratified space like it was when you had the upper bound, but it is homeomorphic to one, just like it was before. This is a very, very hard theorem. Um, and what's the year on this one? What's that? Uh, the very last one, yes. So what's the year on this one, Perlman? I mean, he never officially published the silly thing, so it's hard to actually well, do that. know it? I mean, I, would, I don't know exactly. I'd say in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, in that vague time frame. That was a handwritten man. He was here, right? Early 90s. Was he here in those years? Yes, in 94. 92 or 93. He was 92 or 93. He was here. Yeah. <laughs> and something that was uh, extended on this by Fukai and Yamaguchi was to say that the isometry group uh, of such a space, such a limit space, and a lower sectional curvature is, is a, a lead group. This is important for fundamental group reasons. You can prove something about the fundamental group right away if you know this. Well, not right away. It takes work, but that's what we did. OK. That's background, OK? So now uh, that's background up to Ricci curvature. So now we're entering sort of a, a worse world. We're entering the world of Ricci curvature. So what was known? Um, in terms of the first structure theorems, this goes to Cheeker and Colling in the mid-90s. So essentially, what they proved first is that if the limits non-collapse, so that is these things now, and this is essentially something we'll keep the rest of the time. So I'll just write it in a nice big I'll refer to it. Well, all these theorems have less and less hypotheses. Absolutely. Yeah. So right. either collapse or non-collapse. Yeah, yeah. I mean. And now, now we're beginning to get into the world of uh, where it's going to get worse. So, okay, so if these things have just lower Ricci bounds and a lower volume bound, then, then what Jigger and Colling proved is that at least away from the set of Hausdorff dimension, co dimension 2 in here, then it's actually homeomorphic uh, to a Riemannian manifold. 
Right? So, I mean, at, at least in this context, you can say there's this open dense subset. It's, it's not actually open the way I just said it. Um, <clears throat> there's at least this dense subset uh, where you can sort of pretend like it looks like that. Oh, I mean, open dense subset for the manifold. That's actually fine. But where it actually has at least what you might call a spoon structure, even if the metric doesn't really quite agree with it. And what they proved in the collapse setting, so if I were to drop this assumption here, is something uh, that's a little bit nastier. They proved that, at least on a set of full measure, that every tangent cone is unique and is some Euclidean space. But the Euclidean space may change from point to point. So, I mean, the, the basic example to keep in mind that wasn't sort of ruled out there is going to be something like this. Wait, you're saying the Hausdorff measure is finite for, in its dimension? Uh, no, the, the same what same measure is talking Yeah, okay, fine. I, I was sneaking this past everybody. Um, so the point is that the natural measure to consider here is you take the Riemannian volume measure on this, you divide by the volume, so say probability, something like that, and you limit that up to a measure down here. That's the natural measure you consider there. It makes it hard to give a non-technical talk when people ask technical questions. <laughs> um, I tell all the truth. <laughs> that's true. The truth. No, that's absolutely <laughs> true. Um, okay, so for instance, the type of thing to keep in mind will be something like this, like a horn. So you view this as being like 10 dimensional over here, like one or two dimensional over here, and sort of meeting up here, right? So a priori, something like that could appear as a limit space. Um, um, but based on that statement. And of course, you can imagine much worse things because this is just a, you know, this is a statement about dense sets. I mean, the, the different dimensions could be mixed together in some sort of nasty way. But this is a good clean example to keep in the back of your head something that might happen based on that. But what they did conjecture is that shouldn't happen. So, so they did say that uh, this sort of situation where you have different dimensions in different areas really shouldn't happen even when you're collapsing from these limits. Um, and then again, they, they conjectured that, um, this is also Kai Yamaguchi, I guess, that the isometry group of the limit space was a Lie group. Again, this, this has applications to uh, the fundamental group uh, of the space. Um, I, I will point out, I think it's said there, that in the non collapse setting, um, so with this, they proved the limit space, the isometry group was a Lie group. So they managed to do it in that setting. All right, one more ba uh, background, and, and then we actually start some new stuff. Boundary Ichi curvature. So finally, we consider the case where not only we assume the lower bound, we're going to assume an upper bound here as well. What else can we say? So this is crash course time, I guess. <clears throat> In dimension four, almost everything is really well understood at this point. So I mean, if you uh, have dimension four, say the other characteristic is bounded, but I'm sure this isn't always necessary. Um, the, the volume is bounded from below, so it's now collapsed. Then it results due to a whole bunch of people um, basically give a complete picture of x. Uh, it says that, in particular, the limit space, in this case, has to be a Riemannian orbifold with isolated orbifold points. So, so it's a very clean picture. Um, the isolated orbifold points there, you sort of visualize as being where everything goes bad, so everything is really good away from a finite number of points. But you have those finite number of points that connect together pretty well. And what you can really do in higher dimensions, even, is that you can say the similar things are, are true if the other characteristic is replaced by an integral curvature bound. Um, and, and I mean, morally speaking, that's what the Euler characteristic bound is used there. If you use a, a gap spinning formula, so it's really having integral curvature bound control. Uh, how good are the limits uh, at the smooth part of these manifolds? Uh, if, if they're Einstein, they're smooth Einstein things in this case. So they're very, and even over the orbifold point, they're smooth. They lift a smooth orbifold over that. So I mean, they're, they're very nice. Um, they're perfect, in fact, in, the, in this non class four dimensional case. Everything you could possibly want. So, so the limit is actually a smooth limit? Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, even smooth in the orbifold sense. I mean, so it, okay. yeah, it's perfect. <clears throat> and if you go dropping all your assumptions, you just have some boundary reaching and non collapse, the most you can really say is that away from a set of co dimension two, um, then it's going to be, say, a Riemannian manifold. That much can be said. Okay. Now, lower reaching curvature, new stuff. <clears throat> Anybody who's somehow tuned out at this point, this is a good time to come back because we're starting a new subject. I'll let you know each time we change subjects so that way you can sort of come back in if I've lost you at some point. <clears throat> what we're going to talk about now are sort of uh, the results, I'd say, maybe from the last three years or so. Um, so most uh, 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 sort of the advances for limit spaces with just a lower Ricci curvature bound now that have come from a better understanding of um, geodesics in the limit space. So 
the, to sort of understand why and where this might come from, uh, well, let's start with some intuition of a theorem by Petroleum. Just erase all this nonsense. Always have lots of geodesics, right? All these spaces. Absolutely. There, I mean, they're all length spaces, and there's a minimizing geodesic can't come two forms. There's lots of them. Okay. So there's a, a lovely theorem by Petroleum. So what's this theorem say? So let's say we have some limit space x. I'm sort of modeling like this. Let's say we have some sort of limit geodesic or some minimizing geodesic inside of it. Minimizing is important for this. And take two points on the interior. Now remember, this is a limit space now. If this is a limit space, but with lower sectional bounds, so, so a stronger assumption than lower Ricci. So if we assume lower sectional, in fact, all you have to be is Alexander off for all this to hold, but let's not worry about that. <clears throat> then the statement was the following. So if you pick these two points, and you look at their tangent cones, so their infinitesimal behaviors, what they look like infinitesimally, then the tangent cone here and the tangent cone here are isometric. Tangent cones cannot change. Infinitesimal behavior uh, of your spaces cannot change along minimizing geodesics. That's the statement. Beautiful, beautiful theorem, yeah. In particular, this tells you the regular set is totally geodesic. Um, so this, this lets you know pretty quickly that if you take two points inside the smooth part, if there is a smooth part, there actually always is an open in subset which is here, then you can then minimize and geodesic stays inside the smooth part. And now the basic question here that is, and we really care about limits with lower Ricci, and so we want to ask, is the same thing true for limit spaces that have a lower Ricci curvature bound? The regular set means for the tangent cone is flat. Absolutely, all right. Yes. So that has an open set by this theorem. I mean, it contains it on every curve. Well, that, that's known uh, to be an open set by, by uh, Perlman and various other people in this context. But yes, it, that's true. But I mean, it is known to be by Perlman anyway. Uh, although I don't think it follows from this completely. I mean, I'll actually give an example. Yeah. So the question is, does it hold for, wait, let's do it. Ah, get rid of the whole thing. Okay. So does this sort of theorem hold for limit space with lower Ricci bound? Punch line is broken? No, definitely not. Um, there's lots of reasons for this, and I can go into various technicalities, but I'm not. Instead, what all I'm going to say is that if you work hard, you can do the following. You can build a limit space. Um, these things satisfy these two conditions here, the lower Ricci, the non-collapse. And there's a minimizing you get inside of it. And at every single point, the tangent cone's unique, so with testable behavior, there's no problem with this. Um, but at no two points is the tangent cone isometric. Now, it's different everywhere as you move along. So I mean, this is just sort of saying what no means in more words. So you can't preserve tangent cones while minimizing geodesics. <clears throat> um, that's what I just said. OK. So what you might ask, though, is can you maybe do just a little bit worse? If, they, if infinitesimal behaviors don't have to be constant along minimizing geodesics, can it possibly be that, that how fast they can change is controlled? That if you're long enough minimizing geodesic, that this infinitesimal behavior, the tangent can't move very quickly? The answer to that is yes, actually. You, you can actually control the rate of change uh, of tangent cones uh, along this thing. So they can change, but they can't change too fast. Are they hoping more? Uh, I've got no theorem that says they have to be. Um, I doubt it. I don't think so. I mean, I'll, I'll mention something at the end where why, but. So here's the theorem. So <clears throat> this is what uh, uh, Toby and I proved uh, a couple of years back. It says the following. It says, take such a limit space and take such a minimizing geodesic and take two points, x and y, say, and say we're at least some definite, I mean, this is all effective, what's being said, so we're some definite amount from the endpoint, some delta. <clears throat> then let's try to compare the tangent cone here and the tangent cone here. And since we're insisting on a certain amount of rigor, what that should really mean is, let's look at, say, the ball of radius one of these two things so they become compact, so that's fine. Then if you look at how close, if you measure the of hausdorff distance between the tangent cone here and the tangent cone here, then it's bounded above by a constant time for the distance between x and x minus uh, x to y to the alpha. That is, it, can, it has to change at a continuous rate. It changes at most a holder rate. 
So how close these things are, go to zero at a holder rate as x and y approach each other. So tangent points can change, but they have to change continuously. Um, and in fact, at a holder rate, some alpha. Which always depends on n. Uh, alpha only depends on n. Um, and in fact, let's do it again. It is um, essentially one half. Um, I can tell you in various technical reasons what that means, but let's just leave it at that. It's essentially a half. Uh, and more than that, this one half is sharp. So what that means is as soon as it's changing at a holder rate, it's natural to ask, well, it changes at the Lipschitz rate. I mean, it's doing better. These examples I mentioned at the beginning where these things can change at every point, you can actually sort of, uh, again, if you, you work at it a little bit, you know, for every epsilon, you can make sure that they change at a rate that's one half plus epsilon holder. So the one half is completely sharp. So they change at, I mean, this one half rate is as most as you can expect. And just for the sake of um, saying an effective version of the statement, which maybe even be pictorially a little bit better, well, um, instead of just comparing the tangent cones, what you're really saying is that we take these two points, and if we take balls or radius r around either of them, then the gruel of house rope distance between this ball and this ball is at, is at most changing at a uh, holder rate. So that is. Write this in terms of the points on the this R inverse is just because since these are balls are radius, so I don't know, you should compare them in the scale. That's a much stronger statement. What's that? That's a much stronger statement. Yes, it is. And that really that statement here is what actually proved that. I mean this is what we actually proved. The potential is not something to be right? No, they are not. So this is what I'm sneaking by in some of the language there, is, is the fact that you have to compare tangent cones that come from the same sequence of dilations, because they don't have to be unique at the two points. Right? So really, this, this is the right way of thinking about it, is comparing balls of the same size. And the tangent cones from the same sequence have to be changing at a holder rate. So what could be the um, so, I mean, right, so I mean, you should always just sort of view this as being a cone over something. And maybe here it's an ellipsoid of something as a cone. Over here it's an ellipsoid over maybe a slightly more elongated. So, this is elongated in one direction, this is elongated in one direction. You just see the picture the cone changing. I mean, the sort of sphere, the geometry of the sphere sort of morphing as you move along it. I mean, sort of, that, that's the best I can think I can do on a blackboard in terms of a picture. The two manifolds are close and Lipschitz in this Hausdorff distance that they're actually homomorphic as close, right? Oh no, no, no. In the Lipschitz distance, but not, not in the normal Hausdorff distance. No. I, I mean, I can just sort of take anything, for instance, with this. Little. And, I, and exactly little, and just add whatever I want right here, and that doesn't see the normal Hausdorff at all. I mean, you know, up to epsilon. If there's a ball radius epsilon, it doesn't see up to epsilon. There's still epsilon close. Can the cone angle shrink, shrink to zero if you have a honest cone? No, so the volume of these things actually it have, to, have to be at least comparable. They don't have to be the same because you're moving along, but you can't prove the volume. is. In fact, that's the first stage of the proof because that's technically very hard. Um, you have to prove first that the volumes basically are, are moving in themselves at a holder rate, so that it can't shrink to zero. Is the space of tangent cones compact, I guess? Yes, always. Always compact. That, that, that's for any lower reach you think. Oh, and let me just emphasize, I think we, we do not need this assumption here for this. There's no non collapsing going on here, right? So we need a limit space that can be collapsed. This still holds. So the non collapsing is not playing a role here. Okay, how do we prove this roughly? Like, I'm going to give you, you know, the, the 25 word version uh, of how, how this all goes. So there's usually two points in any proof, right? Um, that there are estimates, and there's how we use the estimates. So I'm going to start with how we use the estimates, because this is the intuitive picture you keep in the back of your head. So the point is that if we want to say this ball here and this ball here are normal pals were close, then we have to compare this ball to this ball. Right? How do you do that? You have to get a mapping from here to here. So the starting point is you pick this point P here, which is one of the endpoints of your deodestics. You look at the distance function to it, and you look at its gradient. So it's an L infinity vector field. And you look at the gradient flow with respect to that. 
So you flow by the gradient flow of this L infinity vector field. This is only defined on a set of, of um, open measure, uh, an open dense subset. So really it's a measure theoretic gradient flow. Um, <clears throat> But what's, and for that matter, I mean, being it's only an infinity, you certainly don't have things like to control gradient flows. Usually you ask for things like Hessian bounds on this. This thing is L infinity. You certainly have no such things going on here, right? So we're going we're gonna to have this measure theory gradient flow, but we have no estimates on the thing that we're actually flowing by. And the basic theorem here is that for a measure theoretic statement, you actually don't need estimates on this. It's enough if you can prove that there exists a smooth function which is close to this thing, which approximates it in some sense. Say L2 is actually the, the right thing to look for. And for what you have, say, even just L2, Hessian estimates on that. So it's not to say that we're not taking the gradient flow of the smooth approximation we have estimates on. You're taking the gradient flow of this guy here. But you, all you need to actually control it in reality is the existence of a smooth guy nearby with control. Okay, it turns out. You have a gradient of a function and then you have a fu function. Yep, there you go. Okay. So the first sort of quote unquote theorem is that. So the point is that all you really need, so we need a good approximation to the distance function, is what we need. And if you can do that, you can gradient flow by this thing. This is where estimates come from. So you need to build a good, smooth approximation to the distance function. Okay. So roughly speaking, let me just sort of say what was known before and um, ideas similar to this and at what point they fail and we have to do something else. Usually, um, the, way to, uh, the way smooth approximation to the distance function sort of thing has been done, not for gradient flows, but it's been done in other contexts, is you look at harmonic approximations, say. So you just sort of fix the boundaries on some ball and you look at the harmonic function that has the same boundary values and then you prove stuff about it. Now, the problem is that even if you work quite hard in that case, so say we take some harmonic approximation of the distance function, and let's say we ignore all the LP stuff floating around here because that just makes everything complicated. Pretend like we have pointwise bounds. I mean, this, that's nonsense, but pretend like we do. Um, then the best that ever got proved for a harmonic approximation is that there exists some epsilon for which the Hessian of this thing is bounded above uh, on, on this ball, say, by a constant times r to the epsilon minus 2. Now, that's useful in the sense that if you're comparing two balls close to each other, then somehow this is better than scale invariance. So if you go blowing these things up, it's like saying it's kind of looking small at that scale. But if I actually want to go all the way from over here to all the way over here, then if you actually just integrate this thing out, even again ignoring all the LP nonsense floating around, the most you're going to get is that the chroma of housework distance between these two guys is at best controlled by this, this sort of holder business. Uh, but times an R, which is, so what you'll get if you actually use this estimate, you plug in and you integrate out just in standard estimates, is bound and bought by that. So that as R goes to zero, you actually have no comparison of these two balls at all if they're at a far distance away. So essentially, all the work in the paper is about actually saying that, first off, there's a better approximation. In fact, it turns out for the harmonic approximation, this is sharp. You, you can't do better than that. Yeah. For the harmonic approximation, this is sharp, this estimate. You can't do better. In some sense, it smooths too much. Um, so you can find a better approximation. Actually, you flow by the heat flow by a very given amount of time, like, like a specially chosen amount of time. And for that, I'm so lying a little bit, you, you can take the epsilon to be 2. And I mean, this requires very different techniques, actually, but nonetheless, they just say we can do it. And then once you can do it, that gets rid of this R factor here. And then that's exactly what we want to prove. You flow for a short amount of time, depending on R or something? Say this again? You flow for a short amount of time? Yeah, like R squared, by the scale invariance amount. Absolutely. Where, where are you doing all this flowing? Is this back in the approximating sequence? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, because then all this can really be done over a smooth manifold, limited out, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, we flow over there. And if you want, pick some large ball containing this with boundary condition zero or something like that. Since you're flowing by R squared, that doesn't affect anything from the flow. The estimates, I mean. They're usually boundary conditions, but that's all relevant. Okay, so there you go. That, that's uh, R in 30 words or less, what's going on. <clears throat> so all that being said, so what? I spent all this time saying that we can control how GSX move uh, I'm sorry, tangent codes move along GSX. 
Who cares? Um, why do we go to all this effort? Um, so some basic corollaries of this. Uh, so first off, um, you can prove, and I'll give you sort of an easy version of this. Uh, you can prove that this first conjecture I wrote down before, that if you look at a limit space possibly collapsed, then for an open dense subset, I keep saying open, for, for a set of full measure, um, there's a well-defined dimension. So there's a well-defined dimension for a limit space. There's a set of full measure where the tangent goes are unique and a single Euclidean space, not one. So that is to say, that guy there can't appear as a limit space, as a collapsed limit space. Let me argue for this guy, and then the actual argument for the general thing is basically that plus a, a lot of measure theory. So how would, how would we convince ourselves that this can't be a limit space uh, thanks to lower reachy curvature bounds? Take a point here in our one-dimensional piece, or two-dimensional piece, I don't care. A point over here in, in our higher dimensional. Connect them by minimizing geodesic. It always exists such a thing. Now what do we know? The tangent cones over here are, I'm going to say, R10. The tangent cones over here are, I'm going to say, R2, whatever. But tangent cones have to change at a continuous rate. That's not true. No. So that's it. Yeah, it can't arise. And if you work a little bit, you can even prove more general theorem. But it's the same rough idea of my measure theory nonsense. OK. Um, so we have a uniquely defined dimension. <clears throat> In particular, we have a uniquely defined regular set now for collapse limits. And so the second thing, actually, is that this regular set is itself weakly convex. So roughly speaking, what that means is that if I take two points inside this regular set, so this sort of Euclidean manifold-like piece, then I can't quite claim I can connect them by minimizing geodesic totally inside the regular set. But for every epsilon, I can connect them by a curve gamma whose length is almost the distance between them, and which is completely contained inside the regular set. So weakly convex in this sense of the word. Yeah, just already for a cone, you have this issue, right? Uh, so for a cone, though, like if it's an honest cone, the minimizing yes between here and there will skip this point. It'll kind of go like that. Right? So, so actually, for cones, it will miss the singular point by itself. And one more thing that's a corollary, and this actually follows from the statement I just made here, is actually the asymmetry group of a limit space is a Lie group. So this is the second thing I've tried mentioned. Um, saying this in 20 words or less, why? Um, <clears throat> so this has to do with the convexity property. So roughly speaking, you have to show there's no small subgroups inside the isometry group. This is Hilbert's fifth problem. So what you do is you assume that's not true, so there's small subgroups. And you use the convexity of this to basically push these isometry group actions into regions where you know things look very Euclidean. And then if you limit that out, you end up getting small subgroups inside the isometry group of Rn, and that's your contradiction. But you need this sort of convexity property to actually make this all rigorous. OK. That's it for lower Lorenzi curvature. So this is one of those plenty of times where if you've tuned out at some point, it's a good time to actually no, look the up. The problem isn't known for homeomorphism groups, right? You need some sort of smooth stuff. These are isometries. Yeah, these are isometries. So you know things about compact. I mean, there's a whole bunch of structure there that you know enough to actually apply. This inequality you've written seems very weak. If X and Y are very close to each other. So, so you, you may have to go a large distance epsilon, even if the points are very close. So this, what's the point? Stop gamma less than or equal to D plus epsilon. Oh, this is for any epsilon. Fix your favorite epsilon. And you can find such a curve. That's what I mean by weakly convex. It's not a very good convexity otherwise. Right? So the points for every, I'm sorry, I really should have said that if that wasn't clear. For every epsilon bigger than zero, I can find a curve gamma epsilon totally inside the regular set whose distance is close, so it's as close as you like. I mean, it's just maybe if you limit this out to the minimizer, it's like, I mean, the picture here maybe to keep in mind is like, you know, imagine this minus the point, right? Now you have these two points, and this is Euclidean space, you've got to bounce around. So the limit might actually not be inside the regular set for whatever reason, but you can get as close as you want. But that's what the picture looks like. The length is down. Oh, the length's going to the distance. Um, so, I mean, you take as close to the distance as you want. So, certainly bound, I mean, as close to the distance as you oh, want. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah distance is going to right. So always when you conclude that the uh, isometry group is a group, you also get a, a dimension bound on the usual one. 
mining job and treats that together. That's right. We also get estimates on, on the fundamental group of the Fed. This was basically a Wil Wilkin and Kasparov use that to do that. I mean, essentially, it's like pretend like your fundamental, roughly speaking, pretend your fundamental group is bad. If I take a sequence uh, of such phases where it gets worse and worse, it'll limit out to something so god awfully terrible in the limit. But it, it, it's it's a, it's a lead group, so how's that possible? It's not contradiction. Right, so you can prove stuff about fundamental groups that way. But how do you go between that and the isometry group by going to the universal cover? No, no, uh, by just, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, by going to the universal cover, right? Exactly. It, it sort of has some isometries that are near, that are near the identity, though. The right, right, exactly, right. I was being very vague about what they actually prove. I mean, they prove it's no code up to something, and roughly speaking, an argument of Fukai should tell you how to go about this. Okay. Bounded Ricci curvature. So now we're going into the same sort of deal, but now for the next part of the talk, I'm you know, adding up, adding on this, and now for bounded Ricci curvature. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just simply say, okay, well, what's all this geodesic nonsense tell us about limits with bounded Ricci curvature? Just, just you know, well, what are our corollaries there? So to get a nice corollary, what we're going to assume about the limit space is that it's got bounded Ricci curvature and it's non collapse. So in this case, what you can now prove is that, just by applying the same theorem, that the regular set is no longer weakly convex, it's totally convex. So if you take any two points, so the regular set is a completely nice thing now. It's a, it's a smooth, open manifold now. Um, well, C1 alpha, depending on you know, if it's just a bound on the Ricci. Um, so the statement is, if you take two points inside of it, then any minimizing geodesic connecting them is completely contained inside the regular set. So the regular set doesn't see the singular set from this point of view. Uh, how do you prove that, by the way? So the regular set is known to be open. This says that along the geodesic, it's closed. Done. So, so I mean, the set of points where this is inside the regular set is open and closed, so that's it, you're, you're finished. So, so where does the upper bound of Ricci curvature go? Appearance? Open. Knowing, no, knowing that the regular set is open. Right, this is not known in general. Isn't your picture a counterexample? You took two points very near the boundary. Then yep. the GDS between them would touch the boundary. This? Oh, that's right here. Oh, well, I knew this to be some open set. This, this is, I mean, you're, you're supposed to be away from boundaries. I, I just wanted to say, you know, this is part of X. There's no real boundary here. The boundary's line. Well, take that picture anyway and apply your theorem. Uh, so the theorems only work for things that are locally complete. So it would work like away from the boundary, right? I mean, it doesn't actually work when you push up to on its boundary. Well, the, with the boundary on, it's still a metric space. Sure, but it's not a limit uh, of things which are locally complete oh, guys with. Right? So I mean, yeah. So it only yeah, yeah, yeah. good manifolds. Right. Otherwise, you could take anything you want, sort of, um, right. make it really bad, so we'll throw it out and take a limit, right? And you get all kinds of nonsense that way. Oh, okay. so the regular set is totally geodesic. Um, and there's actually an effective version of this that basically says that, I mean, so now my pictures are starting to become a little bit on the dense side. So let's get rid of them. And it says that maybe you have a minimizing geodesic. Um, maybe only one point is in the regular set, but the other one's actually in the singular set. Um, then everything except that point is still in the regular set. So again, here's our minimizing geodesic. Here's maybe our singular set, here's our point that's in the regular set. Then this guy here is all in the regular set. Um, and the curvature along it, in fact, much better, so the curvature scale along it, um, it is blowing up at most of polynomial rate. I mean, this is roughly just like an effective version of the totally GSX statement. How are you defining curvature? It's, it, this is the regular part. There's no issue in that. For the regular part, you have, oh, that's, I mean, for the simplicity sake, I mean, we said maybe this is Einstein or something, or so it's smooth in this open regular part. I mean, curvature is no problem. So this is, the state is A, this is all in the regular part. That means but curvature makes sense there. How do you know there's a smooth metric on the regular part? Oh, no, no, no. If this is a limit with bounded Ricci, or say Einstein even, then away from the singular set, it's, I mean, there's an open in subset which is smooth. So this is no problem. You, you know there's a metric there, and it's a smooth metric. Well, for the Einstein case, case, the Einstein case, I agree, but it's just bounded Ricci curvature. Is and for the bounded Ricci, <coughs> the correct statement would not be in terms of curvature, but in terms of the harmonic radius. The harmonic radius right. is up at most of. Uh, right. uh, right. But that would be the regular statement there. Right. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, next issue. So we're going to talk about, so again, we're sort of changing gears a little bit here. So we're still talking about bounded Ricci, but we're going to talk about different ideas. Um, <clears throat> so, wow, I, I am like a third of my way through the talk. There's no way I'm getting through all this. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I went too fast. I gave this talk like a week ago, and I went way too fast. So I decided to slow down, apparently, a little too much. That was slow. This is slow down. Better. This is way <laughs> slow down. I have no idea. <laughs> I went through three times this much last time. Okay, so it's take three it's much better to say a small amount of people. I bet there are people who disagree with the statement. <laughs> okay, so. Forget that. <laughs> okay, so. What we've seen so far is that you take, if you take limit spaces and they have bounds of the Ricci curvature, then you can only say, away from, let's say, the code dimension 2, this thing has sort of a manifold structure. Maybe you can improve this if you assume some sort of LP estimates on the curvature. But there's two problems. First off, how structure dimensional control is miserable. It's just awful. Why? Because it doesn't stop something from even being dense. You can have house of dimension zero, and you're a dense subset, right? Now, maybe you assume it's closed, or you know it's closed, so now it's not dense, but it's arbitrarily dense. Right, so it's a very weak statement. There's nothing effective uh, about Hausdorff dimension. So we want to do better. So the first question is, can we improve on the Hausdorff dimension statement? And the second is, do we really have to assume assumptions on the LP curvature, LP norm on the curvature? Can we maybe even conclude that there are LP norms on the curvature, just from being Einstein? Two basic questions. More effectively, we'll say it this way. If we Einstein look at it. your way of saying Ricci bounded sort of. What's that? I just your way of saying Ricci, well, Ricci bounded. Ricci bounded, that's the implication. I know. Yeah, I mean, this all works for Ricci bounded, um, but you've got to replace most of the curvatures by harmonic radiuses. So I'm going to say Einstein, so that what I'm writing is totally rigorous. So Einstein is constant? Yeah, but you don't have to assume that. That's totally unnecessary. Okay. Bounded Ricci is completely enough for this. All of this. Go away. Okay, so first let's define the notion of a regularity scale, because this is like the effective version, oh, silly thing, of. Um, uh, a curvature bound at a point. So the regularity scale is defined to be the following. If I pick some point x, then r of x, which is what that sort of thing is supposed to be, is the maximum, say from 0 to 1, such that the soup on a ball of radius r around x of the curvature is bounded above by r to the minus 2. Why the minus 2? Because this is scale invariant. If I blew up my space so that the ball of radius I became a ball of radius 1, it's like saying you have a curvature bounded by 1 on a ball of radius 1. Okay, so it's the right scale invariant notion of that. Why do you cut off your line? Uh, because I mean, if this thing is non compact or goes out far, I just really don't want to. I mean, somehow small scale and big scales are different things sometimes. Like if it's, if it's reachy flat, there's no reason to. But if you're not reachy flat, then getting a bigger scale is sort of like letting reachy curvature become infinity when you scale it back down to a a ball of radius 1. So you really need to bound your scale size if you have a non-zero Ricci curvature. So you want to be scaling up and not scaling down. That's right. Scaling up makes Ricci curvature go down. Scaling down makes it go up, and that's bad. Uh, and by definition, the, the curvature scale is zero if it's not a smooth point. If this thing is not like C2 in a neighborhood of a point, then it's just zero. Right? So you can define this on any metric space. It's just usually it'll be zero. <coughs> scaling variance. So this. Uh, certainly now the curvature itself is bounded point-wise by this guy. But having control on this is much stronger, right? Because have, knowing what this is says that on a ball of definite size, you have curvature bounds of a definite amount. Right? This tells you everything you want to know about the geometry. I mean, everything. So whereas having curvature bounds at a single point tells you nothing. It can be completely wild and arbitrarily close to this thing. So this is what we really care about in the curvature scale. And previously, there have been no real theorems that prove anything about this guy. Not even that there's some one point that has some definitive lower bound on this thing. It's pretty ridiculous. Okay. Now, we're going to control this guy and this guy in a few minutes. Um, but I have to talk about the notion of quantitative stratification. Since, I mean, I've got about 10 minutes, this will probably be more or less where it ends. What I want to emphasize first is that this is the part now that, although I'm going to do everything for, say, bound, lower Ricci curvature is enough for quantitative stratifications. These are the ideas that are quite general. So, so later on, I mean, we put papers out for, say, minimizing harmonic maps between Riemannian manifolds, um, hypersurface, and minimizing hypersurfaces in RN. We put the first sort of LP estimates on uh, um, <coughs> solutions of these things. And it's all by the same technique as that's being done here. So I'm going to say everything in terms of Einstein manifolds or whatnot, but this, this is irrelevant. Uh, the ideas are more general. Okay. 
So the point is this. So what was the stratification? The stratification got separated out points based on, based on how much symmetry infinitesimal existed at the infinitesimal level. So you picked a point, looked at the infinitesimal geometry of it, and you said, how much symmetry did it have? So instead, what you want to do is that you really want to separate out points based on balls of definite size that have definite almost symmetry. That this is a quantitative stratification. So that this tells you, I mean, if you control this guy, this is like saying away from a set of some volume or another, every point has a ball of some definite size with a definite amount of symmetry. And that this is the type of condition you want to control. A definite amount of almost symmetry. Definite amount of almost symmetry, absolutely. Um, the rigorous condition is basically that we say that it's k epsilon r conical if on the ball of radius r it's epsilon almost k conical. But that, that's the intuitive definition. And rigorously, that just means there's something that's actually k conical, uh, which is epsilon closest in the Gromov Hausdorff sense. So there's something that's actually k conical that, that looks close to this in your Gromov Hausdorff sense. And then we separate points by exactly that definition. So this, this is, if you go through the definition of stratification, we do all the exact same things, but we basically replace all, all of our conical with almost conical, these things. That is, you, you separate out points based on uh, which balls don't have k plus 1 degrees of almost symmetry on um, balls of definite size. Um, and notice this exists for a smooth manifold. Not just, I mean, so for smooth manifolds, your stratum is always the highest dimension. There is nothing. This thing is, that's not true anymore. So like the basic example here might be something like this. You've taken your cone point, you smoothed it out. Now at this point here, if you look at this ball here, it's almost zero conical. But certainly infinitesimally, it's just a smooth manifold, right? Whereas this point here, you have to go down to a small scale, but then it becomes almost in conical. It's almost like Euclidean space again. <coughs> Okay. And, and what's actually going to be maybe a little surprising is that we have this effective notion of, of symmetries and, and stratification, but we're going to prove stronger estimates for it. Instead of just proving Hausdorff estimates, we're going to prove Minkowski estimates. What that really means is that you look at the volume of tubes around these things, and you say those are small. So morally speaking, even just for the singular set, To say a Minkowski estimate exists on a singular set would be like, before, if you have a Hausdorff dimension estimate, you put a cap that this thing will pile up as close as you want together. But now if you have a Minkowski estimate, it says that you look at volumes of tubes of some definite size, some radius all around them, and those have to be small. And so automatically, these things can't pile up too much, otherwise they overlap and the volume is too big. OK. And the basic theorem, just sort of saying it in words, is that if you take a limit space, which is a lower Ricci bound, but it is non-collapse. Non-collapsing is very important for this. It's like energy. Um, so it's like saying it has finite energy. Then for every epsilon, uh, you can prove that the vol. So you look at your. So if this were like a you know Riemannian stratified space, this should be like a k-dimensional manifold, right? That's how you're viewing it. And you're saying that if you look at the volume of the ball of radius all around the set. If this were actually a k-dimensional submanifold, it should look like this. Bound above by c to the n minus k. And now we're saying you get everything but. So for any epsilon, um, you can get as close to being a sort of a, a, a volume k-manifold as you want, a volume k-dimensional set as you want. So it's an effective Minkowski estimate. <clears throat> so it controls tubes around the singular set as opposed to just the dimension. And what I, I mean, I don't really have time, so I'm not going to mention so. Uh, really what the ideas behind this are, but I am going to say the following. So there's a standard estimate here that says that if you have a standard singular set, SK, then its dimension is bounded above by K in the Hausdorff sense. This, so this is dimension reduction, is the basic idea here. And what I will mention is that this technique fails to prove this estimate. Um, what one might like to do is essentially take the techniques here and quantize them. Add a whole bunch of contents and keep track of them well enough that you can actually get something meaningful out of it. But fundamentally, this proof here depends on looking at different points at vastly different scales. 
So like somehow it's like you do, I mean, so if you're familiar with the argument, you do one blow up and you do blow ups on the blow ups. And what that means is that you've got like one scale for this point over here, but another infinitesimally small point scale for this point over here. And when you try to do something effective, it all breaks down. They're turning out to be these terrible loops and we just couldn't get around them. So you end up having these new, so we really need new ideas um, to prove this. And actually in the process, we get a very different proof for this estimate. So it's a different way of even proving that the standard sort of uh, has our dimension estimate. Um, well, what's the idea? Okay. Um, so I'll do my best to say this in five minutes or less. Idea. So how do you prove, for instance, the mission of S here is less than or equal to zero? So the first statement is that every tangent cone is actually a cone. So you know this. So everything is zero conical. So now, the basic idea is then that, okay, well now if you look at the tangent cone at some point, now pick another point that's not the vertex, and look at the tangent cone here. Now you've got sort of this symmetry here, so that when you start blowing up this symmetry here, this sort of scaling here now becomes like a double tangent cone, and you end up getting that every point except your original one split in R factor. And if you throw some measure theory into this, you, you can prove this statement here. Okay, now this is exactly the different scale thing that I was talking about, that's a problem. Instead, what we try to do is the following. So this is how standard dimensional reduction forces splittings. How do we force splittings? Instead, imagine you have a point that is conical, and imagine in this metric space you have another point, and it's conical with respect to that point too. How is that possible? Only one way. It looks like R across something. So instead of trying to do like a double iteration to split get an R factor, what you say is what you're trying to force is that most points at most scales look almost conical. And away from a set of small volume, there's some other point nearby which also looks almost conical. And automatically that gives you your R factor. So it's almost like R cross something. Um, so this is cone splitting, this idea. And to actually control this set, we need something called uh, what we call the entropy decomposition. I really don't have time for this. Essentially what we do is that the first thing you, you, you notice is that there's an effective version that every tangent cone is a metric cone. <laughs> Namely, if you fix an epsilon away from a finite number of scales, sort of dropping by you know, a factor of two each time, all of them look epsilon close to, to being zero conical. They almost, almost all of them, to a controlled finite number, look very close. So now what you do is you, you take points and you um, group them together based on which scales they're good and bad at. And then for each of those individual sets, this is very simple to prove, the volume estimates. Because imagine just the zero dimensional case here. So imagine I'm just looking at the set of points now, which are very almost conical at the same scales. So look at an almost conical scale at this point, so like this here, it's almost zero conical. You have two options. Either every other point in the set is contained in this tiny little ball here, or there's a point out here which is not, and by definition, it looks good at this scale, and it's also zero conical, so it splits an R factor. So basically, by separating out like this, you can prove very easily um, that this sort of volume statement for each of these. And then the real trick is proving that there's actually way fewer of these sets than you think there are. There should be lots and lots of these sort of sets in this decomposition, a priori. And you've got to prove there's actually far fewer of them. So if you add up all the errors, it doesn't mess you up. So what is entropy in your context? Entropy is the natural log of the volume. That's a trivia. Yeah, that was quick, but you know, I, I'm actually already out of time. All I will mention then is one more statement. So if we went to Einstein manifolds, down the region again, but let's say Einstein, then automatically, uh, using say um, Anderson's epsilon regularity theorem, um, we get a priori curvature bounds, like, like LP bounds on the curvature and everything, just from this. Why? Because you can use this to say the following. If you look close, the splitting um, uh, in Rn, uh, let's say uh, Rn minus 1 factor for the sake of argument, if you're close to having n minus 1 degrees of symmetry, you can prove you're smooth. Right? This actually, I mean, this, this follows from Anderson's theorem and some stuff of Jeter and Bullock. So there's an absolute regularity theorem here that says that enough almost symmetry and you're smooth. But what we just said was that away from a set of control volume, every point on a ball of definite size has enough almost symmetry and therefore smooth. And if you add up what this all means, this automatically gives you a, a priori bounds on the curvature scale, on the curvature operator, and you know, other such things.
So uh, I'm going to have to quit there because I'm, I'm done. Um, let's just flip through everything else. <laughs> It'll take five more minutes of me clicking just to get through this. <laughs> so we're going to call ourselves done. Okay, I'm done. Questions? These are the credits. <laughs> You're not watching the movie. I, I, I was trying to get to a theorem, but I can't even get to the theorem. Never mind. I, I have a yes. So there's this phrase for me, which is kind of a black box, called Ricci curvature. Yes. And then you derived a lot of theorems, discussed a lot of theorems yes. under various assumptions yes. about the Ricci curvature. Yes. So you go way back to the beginning, when somebody first proved something in synthetic geometry about Ricci curvature. What was it? What does Ricci curvature mean geometrically? If I'm a undergraduate, and I want to read your title. What does Ricci curvature mean to you? Matthew? What's the first thing you can prove? Two things. So you're asking, what would you say is important about Ricci curvature and all this, fundamentally, like at the most basic level? And I say, if you get nothing else out of this, remember the following two formula. Okay. I won't remember this. If you have a harmonic function, then you have Bachmann's formula. So Bachmann's formula says that if you are looking at something whose Laplacian is zero, then the Laplacian of the gradient of that thing, squared maybe, is just what it is in Euclidean space plus something in volume of G curvature. Right? Various generalizations of this idea are very important analysis. This is how you start controlling harmonic functions automatically. Yeah. Point two. This is real Wait, so then yes. even though uh, it's not too negative, is that good or bad here? It doesn't look too good. If it's bounded from below, it's good because this always has a non-negative sign. So somehow you want to control this from below. So lower bounds are Ricci curvature. Oh, I see. Get rid of this term. And then you get an inequality. So if it's not negative Ricci curvature, this is what you have. So that's what oh, non-negative Ricci curvature means. Yes, that. yes. I mean, sticking very simply. Right. That's the first point. And the second point would be there are all kinds of batch generalizations in the following statement. But I'll just put it on like this. The volume of ball radius r is bounded above by the volume of the clip you put in there. And you can make various generalizations like this. What? Okay. Non energy. Again, both these are non energy the way it's being written. Okay. Right. Th those are the two basic starting points for why Ricci curvature counts. Anything else? So it seems like the inequality goes the wrong way. No, not a negative here. No, 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 I mean, you get, you get a, uh, a, a gradient. You want the, oh, the Laplacian. The Laplacian of the gradient to be squared. Oh, the Laplacian of the gradient, OK. So it's like, so it's super harmonic. Yeah. So, so I'll talk about it. Yep. Well, let's thank our speaker again.